and we can get started. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I'm going to start with, I'm going to, we're going to start right away with Tova, um, who, who um, I'm going to be telling her story. She'll take you through her artwork. Um, Tova was born in Poland in 1934. Thanks to the support, persistence, and ingenuity of her Norwegian grandfather, Tol Tova left Poland with her mother on August 20, 1939, which was 10 days before the Nazis invaded Poland and started World War II. Because the British were not allowing any immigration into Palestine at the time, Tova's grandfather cleverly bought round trip tickets <clears throat> for a two week supposed vacation in Palestine. So they were admitted as tourists into Palestine, of course, with no intention of ever leaving. They threw out their return tickets, got settled. Tova graduated fine art school and became an established artist in Israel, working in fashion design, interior design, ceramics, and painting. She also spent time sculpting in studios in Italy. Um, and I just want to show you, this is the, some of the ceramic work she did in Israel, uh, the wall sculpture. And another one is here. These first two slides show many of the, they are ceramic compositions on building facades. And these are, as I mentioned, in Israel. Tova moved to LA with their husband in 1975 and managed a fine Judaica art gallery there for many years. Upon relocating to Orange County, she studied stone and metal sculpture and co-founded the Stone Sculptures Guild of Orange County in Santa Ana, to which she still belongs. And in fact, if it weren't for the pandemic, I'm sure she would be there right now, chiseling away at stone. Okay. Her artwork can be found internationally, including Israel, Norway, Panama, Austria, and the US. Toba sculptures are created out of a, quote, conversation with each stone. Once she hears what the stone has to say, she removes whatever is not essential to the subject matter. Many of her sculptures are strong emotional statements drawn from personal experience. And I quote her, art is a universal language. I wish that my sculptures will make the viewer think when looking at them. Okay, um, Tova, we begin with the picture of her working in her studio. And um, now, I invite you, Toba, now to tell us about this. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your warm words, Beverly. And good morning to everybody. And uh, this is the tree of life that I was commissioned by Hog Hospital to commemorate organ donors. So uh, since I usually work in stone, uh, this one I did in metal. So we can add more because there are more donors coming. Unfortunately for the donors, but people are benefited by that and getting life back. So I chose a bamboo image for the tree because bamboo resembles longevity and it's done of uh, stainless steel and, and brass. So you can see the bamboo. Uh, do you have Beverly another? Uh, oh, this is more enlarged, so you can see. And it's a tribute to, to uh, uh, commemorate organ donors for, for giving uh, life to other human beings. This is another one in Israel that I did also for um, Sheba Hospital in Tel Shomer, and the same idea in a different shape. And this is Etz Chaim. So Excuse this me. is. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So this is actually a sculpture that has a 
an emotional and important uh, statement and a message how important it is to donate organs to that gives life to other people. That's beautiful, Toba. Um, I want to mention that the um, sculptures at Hoke Hospital were written up by the uh, Orange County Register. And at the end of the program, um, we'll be showing a um, list of m several websites. And um, we, if you want any of them, best thing to do will be just to snap a photo of them because it's too much to copy down. Oh, anyway, thank you, Beverly. Thank, thank you very much. Moving on to the next. This is Drop of Sorrow that I created in Pietra Santa in Italy. I named it Drop of Sorrow because I grew up in a family that was mourning all the time for the, their families that that were perished in Auschwitz and, and that we could survive. So when I did that one, I didn't know that it will actually end up in the city hall in Norway. And that's the one that I did in the memory of my grandfather that he actually saved my life, as you mentioned, Beverly. So I enlarged that. This is, I enlarged it in, in uh, black, Onyx and double the size. So I thought that in black it will be more uh, emphasized and stronger. That was the mayor of the city of Hammerfest and my family, which is my son and my daughter, next to the sculpture in, in uh, Hammerfest. And this was in the newspaper, as you can tell. Yeah, in Norway, yeah. This one is done in uh, alabaster, and I did it in a tribute to Dr. Cooperman at uh, UCI, uh, uh, I, uh, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. And this is Dr. Cooperman next to it. And it actually resembles, it's for organ donors. I'm sorry. This one is for macular degeneration. And it shows the different stages in that, uh, in that uh, uh, problem of macular degeneration, which one eye is clear and it has a marble eye and the other one can't see. That's the white, the dry and the wet condition of macular degeneration. So that's at the entrance of uh, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute here in Irvine. This one I named Moderni, which is I'm gratefully thank you. Since I was raised in a traditional family in Poland when I was four years old, my mother taught me the first prayer of the day which is Moderni. And, and I think this is a great statement of gratefulness that we should, we should always remember to be grateful for what we have and sometimes what we don't have. So in, in art in, in general, I think that we can, we can, uh, uh, make a statement in different mediums, in, in uh, music, in poetry, and in sculpting, of course, to, to actually uh, make a statement to deliver a powerful message. And that's what I'm trying to do in, in stone. And succeeding very well. I should add. Thank you. This is a hamsa. <laughs> um, I placed this, um, I placed the order of these slides, and I put this after the um, 
Modéani, because I thought uh, it was so beautiful. They're like negative. They, they complement each other. And this is sort of like the negative. Of yeah, the, there is, there is another hand behind on the other side. Yeah. And the hamse is actually for a good, for good luck. Okay. This is the wave in white alabaster. Carrera. This I named deep cuts. It's also emotional. Those are cuts in the soul. I call that sadness because it happened after I broke my leg walking on stairs and I missed one step. So you can see some steps on the face and, and the wow. sadness. Wow. This is an angel swings that I did after my husband passed away in his memory. Beautiful. I named that one, listen. It's when I came back from a visit in Auschwitz and all other camps to show my children where my family end up. And that's why I don't have family. I always say to my grandchildren, how lucky you are. I never had grandparents, no uncles, no aunts, no nephews. So this is part of my family that the world didn't listen to them to their cry. This is together, or a big hug, in alabaster. I think all of us are in need of this now. Yes, yes. Whenever my friend called me, what can I get you? I said, a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Tova's last slide, and your work is beautiful as, as you are, Tova. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly, for all your help. Sure. Um, Jerry, should we take questions now, or should we just wait till the end? Um, hmm. Why? I don't want to unmute everybody, so if you have a question, you could put it in the chat. Um, oh, I forgot good idea. to say that, I'm sorry, in the beginning. Um, in fact, why don't we do that? Uh, just start putting your questions in the chat and at the end, we'll go through the questions. And uh, then we can unmute everybody at the very end. Um, so I think that's the best way to proceed. Okay, and now I want to move on to Gila Abada who um, I have met somewhat recently and really have enjoyed getting to know Hila. Um, and she's going to tell you her story first. Hi, uh, my name is Hila. I was born in South Africa. Um, I grew up during the apartheid era, uh, the 50s and 60s. That's enough. You don't need to know more than that. Um, my family were originally from Lithuania and the way we landed up in South Africa is that after the First World War, my grandmother had a ticket to leave and there were two ships, one to America and one to South Africa, but the queue, the line to the South African ship was shorter, so she decided to take that boat. And that's how we came to South Africa. Growing up during the apartheid era, it, well, growing up in Africa is something that nurtures your soul in a particular way. It creates a specific sensibility that is always part of my artwork. And as a teenager, I made Aliyah to Israel and I spent my adult life um, in Israel for 25 years. So that had a very um, 
impactful effect on my artwork as well. Um, and it's something that just becomes part of you and it comes out in various ways. It manifests, I like to say. I have a background in art therapy, which allows the unconscious to come out in play. And it always chooses to come out in play in ways that show the, the, the sensibility that makes you are who you are. So if we go to my artwork, you'll hopefully see what I'm talking about. Okay, the first picture was me outside my studio um, in Huntington Beach. That painting is called 150 Degrees and it's about the fabric of the universe unraveling. And you can see the different human figures falling off the grid if you want. If we go to the next picture, this one is called Home Village. And this is a very African style painting. It's acrylic on canvas. This is the way Africans depict an aerial view of their village. You can see the river, which is close by. You can see the sun. You can see the hunting. You can see the hunter. You see the water at the bottom, the lakes where they cultivate. You can see the fields. And at the bottom, you see the snake, which is for Africans, it is the way their ancestors show themselves when they want to connect with the living. So that was my, part of my roots. If we go to the next one, this is called The Blessing. And this is actually a diversity piece. The, the writing, the text is the Koanim prayer for the nation and the tree of life at the bottom with the vines that join us all, uh, regardless of color, regardless of race, regardless of whatever. Um, so that is, uh, I have a, a, a certain affinity to hands. I'm not quite sure, perhaps because of Hamsas, which ward off evil and bring good luck. If we look at the next one, this is a tree with the sky. I find trees fascinating. Um, according to the um, arcane sciences or whatever you want to call them, I, ha I am a wood element and <laughs> I definitely have an affinity with trees. But I also believe that trees are the bridge between the sky and the earth. It joins the energy of the whole universe. And this is a tree that I saw on my walk with my dogs in the morning. And when you look up, there's just this beautiful energy of the sun coming in through the, tree, through the leaves. Of course, it's also a tree of life because without trees, where would we be? In the next one, this is also leaves, of course, with a lace pattern. I was just having fun. This was in the days when life was beautiful before COVID, but it still helps me to remember that hopefully those days will be back. In the next one, this is playing with the light. If you look at buildings in the dark and you see all these lovely patterns from the different windows with different colors and, and different backgrounds and the, the domes on the top um, represent Jerusalem. So this is the building and the lighting up of Jerusalem. In the next one, this one is called Once More in English. 
and in Hebrew it's called tshuva. <clears throat> it's a Kabbalistic idea piece. The three red figures are at the bottom are when people are still too grounded in the earth and their hands are where their head should be because they're reaching and grasping. And then you see the next stage where they're uplifted somewhat, but the hands are still where their heads should be. And then finally, they reach the golden stage, I'm calling it, which in Kabbalah joins with reaching the, the light. And the, the symbols going around, the blue with pink, are a reincarnation. So that's that piece. This piece is a handmade silver pendant. Um, I work with something called silver clay, which is like adult Play-Doh. You can roll it out, you can texture it, it's real silver. Um, you fire it in a kiln and the binder, which makes it clay-like, burns away and then you're left with this completely hard silver piece. So this piece, um, the, the cup holding the pearl is 24 karat gold and it's, a, it's about two inches by two inches. In the next one, this is also a pendant, same medium, silver clay. Mm -hmm. That's 24, 24 karat gold at the bottom. And this is a playful piece. I just, um, I made the texture myself and it's, um, it's just one of my favorites. In the next one, these are earrings same medium, silver clay, with fresh water pearls at the bottom. And this is made from something called silver clay paper. It comes in very thin sheets. And this is something that I chose to do with it. Moving on, we have a silver chamsa. Um, this is textured um, I created the texture, I imprinted it on the silver, I fired it, and it's a um, Hamsa pendant. Moving on, this is a ring. Um, again, I made the texture. Those are three yellow CZ stones uh, that are set in it. It's, um, it's a size seven if anyone's interested in it. And it incorporates, I think, both my original African sensibility with the Middle Eastern feel, which um, works for me. Moving on, these are a collection of mezuzot in silver clay and um, accessorized in 24 karat gold. I treat them with non-tarnish varnish, so you can actually use them on your door outside. And there's a whole collection of them. Mm -hmm. If anybody's interested, you can, you can contact me. So that's my story and that's my work. Thank you so much, Sheila. That's beautiful. You know, I've always liked Sheila's work, but um, hearing her talk about it, adds so much more dimension to it. it. You know, it's just wonderful hearing you um, talk about it. You have such, so much to bring to it. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, now it is my turn. Um, unlike our other two artists, I've lived in only one country. However, my path to making art has been an interesting and unexpected <clears throat> journey. I worked and studied in science in the first part of my life, which mm -hmm. I now refer to as my first life. 
My quote, second life began when I discovered art in my early 40s. Um, on a whim, and I cannot figure out why, I don't remember, I enrolled in my first art class ever taken, and that was um, beginning ceramics. And I thoroughly enjoyed it, it was just great. And so I enrolled in another class, and that led to another class, and um, you know the story, I've never looked back. First I learned to throw clay on the wheel and made um, functional pieces. My um, wedding gifts to my, each of my two kids were um, complete handmade wheel thrown um, dinnerware sets. Wow. First, um, now, um, today <laughs> I focus on ceramic sculpture. As you will see um, shortly, I make some artwork just for fun. I like to bring smiles to the faces of the viewers. It's that simple. <coughs> Sometimes the work celebrates the beauty I see in nature. Sometimes it has religious symbolism. Um, mostly, I try to engage the viewer and draw the viewer into the work. And I, I wrote this before I heard Tobin talk about her work. It's, it's interesting, some of our approaches um, um, overlap. Um, and, and as many of those who know me know, some of my work is political. And unfortunately, there's way too much, um, um, there's no dearth of this issues to deal with right now. Often my work carries a message, which I prefer to leave to the viewer to interpret. I love it when the viewer has a different interpretation than I do. I love hearing about it and it makes for great um, discussions. So now I will move on to my work. Um, I'm sorry, I'm hesitating a minute. Ah, this is what I'm looking for. Wrong, okay, wrong copy. Um, okay. Um, this is um, a picture of the um, Orange County Center for Contemporary Art, which I'm going to speak briefly about now. Um, my idea for putting together this virtual art walk at the JCC stems from my experience as a member of OCA, the acronym for, for Orange County Center for Contemporary Art. Um, it's a nonprofit organization run completely um, by its artist members. We do everything, sit at the gallery desk, sweep floors, um, hang the art, um, fix the walls after a show has been up. Anyway, um, the artists get juried into um, the gallery, the, the arts to Oka by their peers. It's um, an alternative art space in the Artist Village in downtown Santa Ana. Some of you may not be familiar with it, but it's just a great place to, to go visit. And we have many activities, including exhibitions of cutting edge art, performances, classes for children and adults, and community outreach. Gila is, I think, yes, our newest member. And um, it's so nice to have her part of the group. And I'm sure she, like I, um, loves the opportunity to get to know other artists and um, to, who are members and then artists in the community and learn a lot. Um, it's great fun. Okay, so I mentioned um, Oka being in downtown Santa Ana. It's a um, anchor for the um, Santa Ana Art Walk, which is held the first Saturday night of every month. And I invite you to stop by um, when Art Walk resumes. Right now, it's, it, it's, it's still um, virtual. So I will move on now to my work. This is my studio, which is a little 10 by 10 foot um, room that previous owners added onto the house. We can't figure out why, but I'll tell you, it was a selling point for me. It makes a great studio. It's small, but I can reach everything, you know, from when I sit at the wheel. Um, and this is um, my kiln, is electric kiln is in the garage. And I 
stole the name that a friend of mine who has her studio in her garage, uh, this is my studio, studiage. I thought that was cute. Um, I have had two shows at the JCC. Um, this was in um, 2009, as you can see. And the last one was in um, 2015. I invited a friend who's a painter um, to join it. In our, and the title was Rimonim, which is the plural for pomegranate. And the show was shortly before Rosh Hashanah. This is, um, okay, Jake and I were fortunate in being able to go to um, um, the south, to the Antarctic um, around 10 years ago, and I was totally awestruck by the um, um, iceberg, and we learned a lot about global warming on the National Geographic ship we were on, and this is a little installation I made um, when I got home. And I'm going to contradict what I said before about not wanting to um, explain it to the viewer because there isn't time now. And you really, to appreciate this and sort of better understand it, you really have to walk around it. Um, but the blue, you know, these are my renditions of icebergs. I made quite a few um, ceramic icebergs after I came home. And these are representative of sort of the industrial world. They're sort of um, symbolic of smokestacks. And if you can tell, um, at, at this sort of end and corner, um, the icebergs are the largest. And then as you move really towards the front, um, you know, there's a few smokestacks back here, but as you move sort of towards the front going diagonally, and it works the same way if you go this way, um, the smokestacks get bigger and the icebergs get smaller. And obviously this was my um, statement on global warming. Um, and here um, is a larger iceberg I made. Um, it's about 18 inches high. And this is a picture. I, I got the best pictures I've ever taken down there. I don't know quite why, but um, this we were guessing is what about a 50 story. Um, just this side alone is about equivalent, very roughly, of a 50 story building, mm -hmm. and um, about 80 to 90 percent of the iceberg is under the water. So you can imagine how big that is. Um, now I'm moving to just sort of the fun things. Um, I've had fun working with, with um, what I call donut shapes. I throw them on the wheel and then I cut them and put them together. Um, and this is also pl uh, playfulness. And there should be a question, coffee, tea, or milk? Which now at good days, I guess we won't hear when we're on an airplane. <laughs> okay, this is, oops, I have to get um, to it. Sorry, um, this is called Little Boxes. And it is based on the um, song written by Malvina Reynolds in probably the 50s. And um, um, Pete, Pete Seeger made it popular. And I'm just gonna play the very beginning those, those of you who are in my generation probably will recognize it. This is Malvina Reynolds singing it. I just love the, the way she sings it. Can you hear it? Little boxes made of ticky tacky little boxes on the side. Little boxes all the same. There's a pink one and a green one. And the blue one and the yellow one And they're all made out of ticky tacky And they all look just the same oh. um, I hope some of you remember that And if you want to hear more of it Just Google her on <clears throat> YouTube I also have enjoyed making totems um, Make a base and then you put a metal pole in it and you can stack smaller pieces. Um, this one was originally called um, 
um, tornado because I, at the time I was dealing with houses and I had fun making this, but I've renamed it um, this past three years. Um, it's now called Topsy Tour because that's what I feel we're living in. Here's another um, Mica Totem, um, which I named Brancusi because I really like Brancusi, mostly for his um, imbalance, his intrigue, and I love the way his pieces are so off balance. Yet, clearly they're balanced. They look off balance. Um, I did a series on pomegranates. I took real pomegranates and made a two or three part plaster mold of um, each one and cut out, before I did that, I would cut part of the pomegranate away. And then I pressed clay into them and made the pomegranate. So they're pretty much life size. Um, and then I, I don't think you can see it in this slide, but pardon me, then I took some real seeds and used the lost wax method to make a few um, bronze seeds that I glued in some of them. Here's a totem I made out of um, pomegranates. Did I mention I love totems? <laughs> and um, I've moved now into Judaica, and this is a um, ceramic seder plate I designed and made. And I've done a tiny bit of um, bronze work, and this is, this is a cover for it. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I want to move through that. Oops. Oh, I guess I can't. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've got the video on. I, I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, I was wanting to put the next slide up, but we'll do that afterwards. It has all the websites on it. Okay. Um, there, um, some of you may have heard when the pandemic first started about the Getty Challenge. Um, and this is talking about the Getty Challenge, its history, the Getty Museum didn't really originate it. And um, so it shows you some of the submissions people made. And I just thought it would be a fun way to end this program. And um, obviously this is um, a magazine article from um, um, PBS NewsHour. So now I will start it again. Look at a social media challenge that is drawing responses from around the world with everyday shelter in place life imitating art as part of our ongoing arts and culture series, Canvas. Can you hear okay? There are no selfies yes. being taken with the Mona Lisa right now. We captured this scene at the Louvre last year during the blockbuster Leonardo da Vinci exhibition. Instead, a new kind of selfie with art is making its way through social media, an updated version of Grant Wood's American Gothic. A dad in his home from school children in a loose version of a 17th century Italian painting titled Lot and His Daughters. Appropriate to the moment, screams. The current call for recreating a work of art at home seems to have begun with a Dutch Instagram account called in translation between art and quarantine. It was picked up by others, including the world-renowned Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, celebrated for its Rembrandt collection. The result, playful recreations of old masters' paintings. In Los Angeles, the Getty started hashtag Getty Museum Challenge, inviting people to use digitized and downloadable artworks. Annalisa Stefan is the Getty's assistant director of digital content. Um, I've seen people connecting, total strangers connecting through this experience, cheering each other on and liking and commenting and favoriting their favorite creations. I also think art has a role to play in helping us make sense of this strange time. I thought maybe we'd be lucky if we got 30. That was sort of, that would have been a, a big success. And I feel like we got probably closer to 30,000, maybe more. So totally surprised. Andy Warhol's soup cans get an update to toilet paper. <laughs> Home dreams of Napoleonic conquest. My favorite is um, a, a Renaissance manuscript page and the artist added a thermometer into the composition and she had been recovering from pneumonia at the time. So, um, you know, this kind of sadness of where we are today can coexist with the joy of being creative and seeing other people be creative in a really lovely way. Among the clear favorites for social distancing art lovers, pets in all kinds of poses and costumes. 
and the work of 17th century Dutch painter Johannes Vermeer, sometimes as in Pug with a Pearl Earring, Ed and Painter come together. Another favorite, Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. One mother made her own version of Kahlo's self-portrait with monkeys. Alana Archer turned to household cleaning products. I was looking specifically for just kind of a strong portrait of a woman, um, and her painting was just striking to me, and it just, there was a sense of empowerment in it that I really enjoyed. The challenge is just one among numerous efforts museums everywhere are making to connect with absent visitors. Many are offering virtual tours of their collections. And while it's not the same as being in the museum and standing in front of a great work of art, this challenge is clearly connecting people to art in new and creative ways, and offering the rest of us a smile in the process. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown. Um, now, I need to, oh, sorry, just a minute, Jay, sorry, I need some technical help. I, <laughs> I think she wants to go back to the uh, page listing some of the sites. It won't do that. Yeah, I just want to get out of this. Uh, me too? Close it. Uh -huh. Uh, maybe okay. Start, why don't you go ahead and start? The oh, there it is. There it is. Here we are. Great. Right. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, if you these, I th these. Oh shoot. Oh. <laughs> I am so sorry. Well, in the meantime, uh, let me look at the chat here because uh, we have some questions. Um, the first, should I start with the questions or are you ready? I am ready, but I might be able now here. Okay, that's why don't it. I finish with this. I apologize. So, um, so these are articles and websites of our of our Go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead Beth. Well, uh, you know what? Let's start with the chat then, Ev. We're just going to start with the chat. Okay. Lois uh, asks, uh, I think this was to Tova, that Tova meant return. Oh, no, this was for um, Hila. Um, Tova meant return, and she had a question about that for Hila. Are you there, okay. Hila? Yes, I'm here. Okay, okay, good. Could you give us the answer to that? What exactly is the question? It says, I thought that Tuva meant return. Uh, you must have said something about Tuva. Tuva. Tuva in everyday Hebrew and in classic Kabbalah means returning to the answer. But in some interpretations of Kabbalah, Tuva has a slightly different meaning. I mean it, in my painting, I mean it as part of the process of reincarnation, returning to redo, retracing your steps till you find the correct answer, as in the correct path. Thank you. Um, there's some uh, things here from Beverly, but I think it's from Beverly's friends, not Beverly herself. <laughs> All three artists' work is impressive. Enjoyed hearing everyone speak. And um, Lois uh, Gorin said, love the little boxes, Beverly. Uh, and she remembered the Pete Seeger song. And then um, there's another one from Myra. Gantz. I'm wondering if Tova made a sculpture for the aging Jewish home in the valley that was of two hands in their courtyard. Um, Tova, you are muted. You have to click on that little red button to unmute yourself. There you go. You're unmuted. Yeah. Go ahead. What is the question? 
um, there's a sculpture at the Aging Jewish Home in the Valley that was of two hands in the courtyard. And Myra was wondering if you made that sculpture. No, no, oh. not that one. No, thank oh, you. Okay. okay. And uh, I think that's all the questions. So uh, did you want to say anything else? Um, oh, wait, there is another one. Thank you so much. This fed my hungry soul missing in person gallery and museum visits by Carolyn Palter. And um, I, I'm wondering if any of you uh, would like to make any further comment. Otherwise, we can open up and unmute everybody and people can ask questions as well. Um, so why don't we go ahead and I'll